Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome everybody to the February 6, 2024 uh, AM Board of Supervisors meeting. Um, before we get into our official business, uh, we have the pleasure of uh, welcoming uh, Reverend Dr. Shelton Pleasant from Antioch Baptist Church. And he's going to be so kind as to lead us in our morning invocation. So those of you who are able and willing to stand for our invocation and remain standing for the afterwards for the Pledge of Allegiance, we greatly appreciate it. Good morning. Let us pray. Gracious God and our Father, we, we thank you, O oh God, for this marvelous day that you have made. We thank you, God, for this assembly to come together to discuss the business of this community. We thank you for the leadership of this community. We thank you, O oh God, how you have protected us and blessed us and kept your arms around us and reminded us once again that you are our God. And so God, as we come this morning, we ask now that you would bless this forum, this community with uh, wisdom, oh God. We ask, oh God, that you would allow us to discuss the business uh, related to the citizens of this community. We ask, oh God, that you would allow us to conduct ourselves on a high plane of dignity and respect. And so God, now we ask that you would Bless now as we go forward, and it's in your darling son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Seems I got a little ahead of myself. I should have called to order the meeting first before the Pledge of Allegiance, but we'll correct that now. I uh, officially called to order the 2020, uh, February 6, 2024 AM Board of Supervisors meeting. With that uh, first order of business is we have an agenda before us. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Move Second. We all move forward um, with the agenda, <laughs> with the agenda as presented. Um, next up, we have our consent agenda, and with that, I'll turn it over to our county administrator, John Agerson, to brief the board. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, members of the board. Just two items on consent this morning. Under item A, the board will consider approval of the January 2nd, 2024 a.m. and p.m. meeting minutes. And under item B, the board will consider approving a resolution requesting VDOT to accept the subdivision streets in section two of the Northridge subdivision into the secondary system of state highways. Thank you, John. Move for approval. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Moving on to item 3.0, general county business. <clears throat> 3.01, the board will hear a quarterly VDOT report from Mark Nesbitt with the Warrington Residency Engineer. Mr. Nesbitt. Good morning, Chairman Bates and, and board. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'd like to recognize I've got a couple of my staff members, uh, Roy Tate and uh, Craig Simpson with me today. Um, but uh, I have a few items just wanted to, 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 to update you on. Um, and of course, I'll be available for any questions the board may have uh, once we get through these. But uh, uh, in January, we experienced our first significant snow event in, two, in about two years. I believe our crews did a wonderful job in their response to the event. Whenever we have an event like that, it typically involves at least a day, day or more of preparations in advance, especially if we pre-treat. And it also takes a couple of days of post-event to get equipment back in condition and deal with post-event cleanup issues. So um, yeah, if we get several inches of snow, it's, uh, it's usually at least a week out of our um, uh, schedule to you know, take care of that. And we've also had to respond to frequent mobilizations for freezing, uh, minor freezing events, uh, typically keeping uh, crews overnight uh, to uh, take care of any early morning freezing. So uh, we've had, that, had to take care of that several times. 
Um, and, and other than that, we've also been responding to a normal work requests and brush and tree removal, gravel road maintenance, and paving and drainage repairs. Um, we are beginning the process for updating the secondary six-year plan for FY25 through 30. We have scheduled an initial meeting with Mr. McLaren to discuss any potential additions. Um, we're expecting some level of cost increase due to inflation that may, may be an issue that we have to deal with, but we'll work through those issues um, that will come before the board in a, in a later meeting. Um, and all the projects we completed last year uh, we will be surface treating uh, or hard surfacing this year, this spring. And then we have about three and a half miles of Old Steel House Road uh, that we'll be uh, working on this year, uh, constructing this year, and also then surface treating next year. So we just continue to peck away at that, uh, the list of, uh, of uh, rural rustics and uh, uh, get to the end or keep, keep getting them done. Um, our paving program um, for 2023 was very successful. Uh, we completed uh, 9.83 miles of, of road with plant mix asphalt and 15.59 uh, miles of surface treatment for a total of uh, over 25 miles last year. We're, um, the projects for this year uh, have already been uh, uh, advertised and, uh, and, and awarded. We plan on paving 22.19 uh, miles with plant mix and nine, uh, nine and a half miles with surface treatment. And um, we are this year was something we're a little different. We're uh, actually uh, through a program called uh, Highway Safety Improvement Program, which is a federal uh, program. We are adding two foot shoulders to each side of Route 229 this uh, this year, um, from uh, just above Ira Hoffman all the way to Route 211. So um, look forward to getting that done. That will provide a level of safety to that route um, in the coming years. Um, the roundabout at Route 3 and McDevitt Drive is, a, um, is still on track for an October 2024 uh, construction uh, advertisement. It is currently in the final uh, design phase and we'll get it right away later this year. That's, that's nothing has really changed from my last update on that. Um, and the two projects that were funded um, on the last round of Smart Scale, uh, Route 3 and Route 669 intersection improvements, uh, so modified R cut is uh, still uh, sc scheduled for construction in 2028. And the uh, roundabout at 229 and 621 is, is uh, still tracking towards 2029. Uh, but both those projects are still you know, on track. Um, the town of Culpeper had three projects funded last round. There's a roundabout at uh, uh, three, uh, Route 3 and 15 and 522, and a sidewalk project on Orange Road and Old Brandy Road. And uh, uh, construction dates have not been set for those projects yet, but they will probably follow the, uh, the in either late, the late 20s or early or around 30, uh, 2030. Um, we currently have two planning studies underway. One is on uh, is in the town on Madison Highway, from Dramana Highway down to Route 29, and uh, also another one is on uh, Route 1529 Business, James, which is James Madison Highway and Brandy Road, um, and those are both underway. We sh we hope to have the uh, uh, those projects completed uh, in the next uh, by the end of March, and hopefully uh, the purpose of those is to come up with potential smart scale projects out of those two. Um, but we've been uh, working with town staff and county staff on those projects so that uh, you know, we're, you know, that we're uh, you know, working together on uh, coming up with those solutions. Um, we also, uh, the county submitted two projects this past fall for revenue sharing program, one on, uh, uh, on River Road and also White Shop Road. And uh, those are still um, in central office under review. Uh, we haven't uh, as of today, this morning, haven't uh, received any confirmation of, of their, um, where, where that program is yet. Uh, hopefully we'll hear something very soon. I'll report back to the board as soon as I hear something, and probably your staff will <laughs> hear at the same time I do. Um, we have a State Force Bridge project uh, that was completed last fall on uh, Springs Road, 802. Um, 
And then we, our next one is on uh, Route 628, uh, Hazel River Road, which will be coming up later this year. That'll be a replacement of the bridge deck on that. Um, we have two, uh, we have completed two traffic engineering reviews recently. Uh, one on Carrico Mills Road, uh, where we ended up uh, installing some curve warning signs, uh, adding curve warning signs to that segment of road. Uh, and also we uh, reviewed the intersection of Jefferson Road and Myers Mill Road, which we ended up uh, installing red reflective tape on the stop uh, signpost and did some tree trimming to improve visibility of the stop sign. A third study is underway to review safety and, and the speeds on Route 685 Chestnut Forks Road. Uh, that is still uh, outstanding. We haven't uh, completed that study yet. Um, on a related note, there is legislation moving through the, the state legislative bodies this year that will give localities and law enforcement the authority to install photo speed enforcement equipment along state maintained routes. If approved, this equipment would be funded, installed, and maintained by the locality or law enforcement agency. There's also legislation proposed to modify the rules regarding allocation of secondary six-year plan funds for gravel road projects. The proposed legislation will allow for funds to be allocated for improving gravel roads without hard surfacing. As you know right now, the funds are dedicated towards hard surfacing or improving gravel roads and hard surfacing them. Um, so I guess we'll find out where that is uh, as we go through the legislative session. Um, that concludes my presentation, and if you have any questions, I'll be glad to, to answer any. Thank you, Mark. Any questions? Mark? Mark, I do have one. Um, I've had several constituents reach out in regards to Settle School Road. I know it was slated for the paving last year, and I guess the winter kind of caught up to us, and you couldn't get it done, and you said it's better to let it sit through the winter. All the improvements to the road have been done. Can you give a, an idea, an estimate of when you foresee the uh, paving process to start back up? Yeah, um, you know, when we, when, when the winter is over, we'll go back out and regrade, you know, fine grade the road again, make sure it's, you know, good ride, and then we'll uh, take care of any issues with it, and then we'll, we'll surface treat it with probably two coats of surface treatment. Uh, probably most likely April, maybe okay. May. April, depending April. on the, the, the weather and temperatures. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. <coughs> Moving on to item 3.02. <coughs> Mr. David Foley of Robinson Farmer Cox Associates will provide the board with a comprehensive annual financial report for year ended June 30th, 2023. This I'll turn it over again to John to introduce this item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Foley's uh, on his way to the podium now, and uh, he's going to report on his audit of the county funds for uh, the year that uh, just ended. So, David. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board. Um, thank you all for having me here this morning. Um, <clears throat> again, my name is uh, David Foley. I'm a partner with uh, Robinson Farmer Cox Associates, and I was the audit manager for the county's um, FY23 uh, uh, financial audit, and we have completed that audit, so here uh, to present uh, the results of that uh, to you all. Um, before I get into the results of the audit, just would like to give a brief overview of the audit that we do um, for the county as, as far as the, the financial statement audit. Um, there's really three main pieces of the audit that, that we do for the, the county as part of the financial statement audit. Um, one, of course, is we audit the, the county's financial statements um, to make sure that the, the financial statements uh, are prepared um, in accordance with generally accepted um, accounting principles. Um, so that's one big piece of the audit. The other two pieces of the audit we do in accordance with uh, government auditing standards, um, one of which is in addition to just looking at the numbers themselves um, as part of the audit, um, we uh, gain an understanding and, and review the um, county's um, internal controls that it has over financial uh, reporting. Uh, we do this for the purposes of designing our audit tests. So as when we're out in the field doing the audit, um, we review and gain an understanding 
uh, the internal controls that the county has in place over its financial reporting and in certain instances we'll, we'll test those controls to see if they're um, operating as they were designed. Um, and then the, the third and final piece is the, the federal compliance piece, the uniform guidance piece. So for the any time a, a, a locality expands over uh, 750000 in federal grant funds, you have to undergo a, a, a single audit um, in accordance with uh, uniform guidance. And so for the various uh, major federal uh, grant programs for the county and school board, um, OMB provides a compliance supplement that lists the uh, the various uh, compliance requirements that the county and school board have to comply with when they're expending the federal grant programs. Um, so as part of the audit, we'll get a list of those compliance requirements and go through to make sure um, that the county and school board are complying with those uh, federal grant uh, compliance requirements. Um, <clears throat> so those are the, the three main pieces of the audit that we do um, for the county. So. As such, included in the county's um, annual comprehensive financial report, there are actually three different uh, reports from us that communicate uh, the results of the audit. Um, the first is in the, um, kind of towards the beginning of the report in the financial section. Um, the first report from us is our independent auditor's report. This is on uh, numbered page 18 of, of the report. Um, <clears throat> in, in the independent auditor's reports where we state that we did perform an audit on the county's um, financial statements, um, it also is where we issue our opinion on the county's financial statements. And we have issued a unmodified opinion on the county's financial statements, which is the cleanest opinion an auditor can give on a set of financial statements. Um, basically, an unmodified opinion means that the county's financial statements um, have been prepared in accordance with uh, generally accepted accounting principles. Um, the other two um, reports uh, from us are in the back of the report in the compliance section. Um, the first report back in the compliance section is our report over the county's uh, internal controls over its financial reporting. Um, this report is on uh, page 207 of, of the report. Um, so this report uh, from us was clean as well. Uh, we noted no significant deficiencies or um, material weaknesses in the uh, county's internal controls uh, that it has over its financial reporting. Um, overall, we feel that the county has strong um, internal controls in place over its financial reporting. Um, <clears throat> just an example of this is, um, you know, as part of the audit, we had very few audit adjustments um, that we needed to make as part of the audit, meaning that the county's books were already adjusted um, accordingly and appropriately before the um, audit took place. And you know, to go through an audit and only have a few audit adjustments, I think, speaks to the strength of the county's finance team and the internal controls that the um, county has in place. And then the uh, third and um, Final report from us is two pages over on page 209. Um, this is our report over the county's compliance with the major federal grant programs. Um, this report was clean as well. We know to know um, significant deficiencies or material weaknesses in the uh, county and school board's compliance over its major uh, federal grant programs. Um, also, no items of uh, noncompliance uh, were noted um, as part of the audit. So again, all three um, reports from us uh, were clean, so very uh, clean audit uh, for the county. Um, just would like to um, conclude uh, by thanking Valerie and, and, and all the, the county staff for their efforts um, in getting the audit done. Um, there's the way auditing standards and accounting standards are these days, there's, there's a lot of um, upfront work and preparation that all the, the county staff has to do in order to get ready for an audit. Um, and so they always do an excellent job of um, having information uh, ready for us when we come on site. Um, in addition to um, while, we're, while we're on site, they do an excellent job of answering all the questions that we have and um, getting additional information that we need um, to, to finish the audit. And, and we certainly know the county staff is dealing with their own, you know, typical uh, daily job duties and 
to have, you know, four auditors, you know, walking into your office, you know, for, for a two week period can, can be a little challenging, but they, they always do an excellent job. So just would like to commend the, the staff. Um, but that's all I have, but be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Foley. Before I open it up for questions, I too would like to uh, commend Director Lamb and all your staff for all the hard work you do year after year to see to it that our financials are in tip-top shape. So just a heartfelt thank you for that. Um, any questions for Mr. Foley? <coughs> Comments? Appreciate the report and uh, thank you for the information. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Moving on to item 3.03, <clears throat> Mr. Courtney Rogers with Dav Davenport Financial Advisors will address the board regarding the financial position of the county. John. Mr. Chairman, as Mr. Rogers comes to the podium, I just wanna briefly say that uh, we, we always invite Davenport to uh, come and speak to us um, once a year as, we, as we're getting into the budget and just kind of report on the financial health of the county. Um, this year in particular it may be of some interest because we did ask uh, Mr. Rogers to look at the debt service outlook for the renovation of Culpeper Middle School. Uh, we asked him to add another scenario with a, an elementary school to follow the next year and uh, perhaps even another elementary school. That, that, that was just to see what that would look like for the time being until, until many more decisions are made. But. Um, I guess the, the good news um, budget-wise is that if I read Mr. Rogers' report correctly, the, the debt service will really kick in uh, more next uh, budget, not the one we're preparing for right now. Um, this first year, I guess, is probably just an interest payment or something, but uh, I'll let Mr. Rogers talk about that, but um, perhaps some of our uh, data center and other development can come in uh, in time to, to absorb some of the, the big hits that, that, that Courtney's gonna talk about. And so with that, I'll turn it over to you. Just just would say, don't show us all 74 slides. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, I'll, I'll, I can move very quickly. Um, thanks, John. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Courtney Rogers. I'm a senior vice president with Davenport & Company. Had the pleasure of working with the county dating back to the 90s with my former firm, um, been with Davenport 25 years now. And uh, so it's been, it's been a pleasure to work with the county and see it grow over the years. Um, it's, but it's been several years. I know a couple of, of the board members here, but there's a lot of new faces. Um, seems like COVID, COVID, with COVID uh, time frames, like felt like we missed a bunch of years seeing folks, but um, great to be back in front of you all. Um, I'll also say you've kind of taken a pause on debt. Um, it's been a while since we've really had some projects to fund and so, if there is any good news, it's that you've got the ability to take on these projects. And I think John hit it on the head. I think the big, the big uh, challenge for the county really at the end of the day is gonna be where do the dollars come from to pay for that, uh, pay for these projects down the road. Um, one thing I'll mention because it's not in the presentation, some of you who, who are paying attention to what's going on in Richmond may have already seen this, but um, there is a bill that seems to have some real legs to it going through the General Assembly that will give local governments, the ability to do a 1% sales tax um, that could be used for debt service on uh, school projects only. Um, it would come back to you all, you would uh, have to approve putting it on a referendum and of course the cons constituents would have to, uh, to approve that. But um, that would be a new revenue source that um, for, I think it's only eight counties have that ability right now, um, but that would give the other counties the ability. So it seems like that has some legs um, and, and may actually go through this year. So something else to keep in mind. Um, but as John mentioned also, uh, we have seen several data centers around the state who uh, obviously they are spinning off some significant revenues and that may be another revenue source. Um, so I wanna do is take a step back and, um, and just walk you through a couple of things. I'm gonna um, first kind of give you a, a, a big picture overview of your credit rating. Um, you have a very good credit, um, you know, good, good timing with the audit being right in front of us. Um, Financials look great is really the big picture here, and I'll go quickly through a lot of these slides. Um, if there are certain questions you want to stop me, I'm happy to answer them along the way. But for, for those of you who, who may be new to, uh, to what we do as financial advisor, part of our job is to put you in the best position 
with advice uh, so that when we do get in front of the credit ratings, we can get as high a rating as possible to help us get as low a debt uh, interest rate, if you will, when we're selling our debt once we get out into the marketplace. Um, and there's really four things that go into it, uh, the economy, financial performance, debt, and management. And uh, you don't have a lot of control over the, of the of economy. Yeah, there's certain decisions you can make. I call it a big, big uh, ship. It's something that takes a while to turn. Um, but the other areas you do have some control over. And so think about that as we go through these. Those are things that over time this, uh, this county's done a great job putting itself in, in, in good position. Um, so those four areas really are, again, the economic base. It's basically a lot of demographics, um, wealth levels, things like that. You've got uh, on the financial performance, we'll talk a little bit about uh, revenues and expenditures, how you perform versus budget, um, fund balances, things like that. On the debt side, it's, of course, the amount of debt. Um, it's the type of debt. It's uh, how fast you pay it off. On the management side are things like what your budget to actual looks like in terms of your projections. Um, do you do projections um, and policies? And, uh, and you, do, you all do a very good job of those. So historically, um, from the bottom up, um, back in, in the, uh, when, at the turn of in the year 2000, we were at the top of the A category. And we've been steadily moving our way up into the double A category. Um, back in 2010, got upgraded to double A across the board from all three agencies that we talked to. And then um, we've kind of moved, uh, not all in lockstep, but uh, you'll see now we've, we're triple uh, A with Fitch, which is the highest you can have. And then uh, very, very strong AA1, AA plus from S&P and Moody's. And we'll talk a little bit about what they've said here on the next couple of slides. Um, so Moody's, their, their biggest, uh, I think, the challenge it, to get you into the AAA category really is size. And you'll see some of that on some of the charts we're going to talk about. Size, some of the income levels, things like that. Um, you can see right there they say tax base size is below their national, you're below the actual median that you're in, which is the AA1 category. So there's other factors that have brought you up into that AA category. Um, they, these are traditional uh, statements that they have in terms of what could lead to an upgrade, what could lead to a downgrade. Um, honestly, I don't think you're in jeopardy of going down at all, even taking on the debt we're going to talk about. Um, you'll see you're in great shape from a debt factor standpoint, from a ratio standpoint. So um, we do not have any concerns that it's going to cause an issue with your rating. Um, S&P, uh, last time we really talked to them was back in 2020, both the agencies. That was the last time we did a public sale. So like I said, it's been a several years since we've done any issuances. Um, and back then, you can see you're at the top of almost all the categories they look at. What they do is they take those categories and, 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 uh, and give them percentages, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, Fitch is a little bit different than the other two. They really look at uh, frameworks, um, essentially the ability for you to raise revenues, the ability for you to make changes to expenditures. Um, your revenue framework is in the AAA category, the expenditure framework is in the AA, and your long-term liability burden and operating performances both score up in the AAA category, which is why you were able to get a AAA from, from Fitch. Um, in terms of the methodologies, you'll see S&P, Again, they put uh, percentages on various areas. You can see the economy is one of the, uh, the biggest percentage that you, that you can get, and that's uh, one of the areas where we didn't score the highest on, and that's one of the things that, as I said, is really keeping us back at this point. Um, they're always undergoing changes. Moody's actually went through a change in 2022. Um, a lot of it had to do with some ESG. A lot of it had to do with transparency, um, and they did make a couple of changes in their methodology. When one of the things they did was institutional framework, which basically is the things that uh, you have to work within in terms of the state code. Um, this state, uh, for governing bodies, you can raise certain revenues with a majority vote of this board. Um, in some states, it takes a referendum to, uh, to raise certain revenues. And so that's not as strong. We get the strongest um, scores in Virginia. But they took that from a 20% down to basically 10%. And what they did is they moved that percentage over into the debt and pension area, particularly the pension long-term um, liabilities side of it. And so that's the, been, that was the biggest change that Moody's had. So quickly kind of going through, again, demographics. A lot of this has to do with that economy side of things. Um, what you'll see here is we're, we're doing a, uh, a comparison to the AAAs in the state the other AAA counties, which you can see we have several, um, and then the other AA1 counties 
that, uh, that are in the state. And what you'll see, the green line shows where you are, you're at the top there. The blue, the blue bar is the median. And so population, you can see we're one of the smallest out of this group. Median household income, we actually fared uh, pretty well out of the AA1s, but we're basically near the bottom of the AAAs. Same with per capita income. When it comes to median home value, you can see we're above several of the uh, Richmond area, um, if you will, uh, AAAs, um, but still below a lot of the Northern Virginias, well above the AA1s. Assessed value, obviously it's been a strength. Uh, you've had nice growth over the last 10 years. But when we look at the larger group, you can see we're actually still one of the smaller. And that was that comment that uh, Moody's made in terms of looking at it from a national standpoint. Then when we look at it on a per capita basis, you'll see we actually aren't too bad. We're, we're well above the other AA1s here in the state, but we're uh, near the bottom of the AAAs. So that kind of gives you a sense of that demographics and the, the economy side. When we look at the financials, um, the financials are very strong. Um, just heard the audit, got a good audit report. When we look at 2023, um, that's the first year in a while that actually at, at the very bottom, um, you actually um, spent more than you actually brought in or used some of your fund balance essentially is what happened. But that's not bad because when you look at the green line there, um, when you look at true revenues over expenditures, you still had a very nice $9 million um, uh, amount left over, but then you have your transfers out, you have your pay-as-you-go your, uh, pay capital and things like that, and that's really where some of those dollars went to. And that's, some, that's not a problem when we're explaining that to the rate agencies. Um, that assessed value growth has uh, enabled you to bring the tax rate down, which has been, been uh, great for the constituents. Fund balance um, has grown. Um, with, I, I'm assuming a lot of the ARPA money is probably part of it, um, that we were able to uh, significantly increase some of the revenues there in 2021, 20, 22. And, and then as you uh, got built up over 21, you started spending some of that. And that's what we saw in that slide a couple of slides ago. You actually spent some of that fund balance down as you've accumulated <coughs> some over the last couple of years. It's still at a very good uh, policy. We're, we're above that 15% target, which is uh, where we'd like to be. Um, well over the 20% range. When you look at the others, uh, there's a couple of different ways we're going to look at this. One is unassigned, and the one is, uh, all, uh, is available, which includes unassigned as well as other committed uh, funds that you have in your audit. Um, when you look at the unassigned fund balance, pure dollars, you can see we're kind of right in the, uh, toward the, I guess, we're above the AA1s, we're toward the bottom of the back pack when it comes to the AAAs, but on a percentage basis, Basically, when you say, okay, what is our fund balance as a percent of our budget, you can see you fare very, very well. And that's one of our strengths is that uh, we're right up there at the top of, all of all, the, all of the localities here. Available fund balance is something that's fairly new. It's something the agency's been looking more at over the last several years, and that's because um, as the audit, um, the GASB rules changed and um, you start having the committed and assigned areas. Some folks were putting their reserve rainy day funds into like an, a committed or assigned fund. And so it was starting to muddy the waters. And so um, the agencies nationally, when they're trying to look at what everyone's doing, they started looking more at this available fund balance. And we fare very well here again on a absolute dollars. Fairfax just kind of skews this whole slide. So um, it's kind of hard to see in terms of their sheer dollars. But when you look at it on a percentage basis, you can see again that we are actually on the higher end of the AAAs in, the, in our Virginia group. And so that, uh, that's a very good number. Debt profile, um, we've got just under 60 million of debt outstanding. Um, you can see it doesn't drop off for several years. It really has a drop off there in 2034, um, about $8 million right now in terms of your budget for 24. When we look at the two key ratios that we look at, which is total outstanding debt as a percentage of total assessed value, and that's including real and personal property, you can see uh, we're nowhere near our policy, which is 3.5%. When you look at, again, these comparables, you can see on, um, we're really right in the middle of the pack on the AA1s, which isn't a bad thing. That means that they've got more debt out there. Same thing on the AAAs. Um, we actually are on the lower end of that. Um, I can tell you that we just did a huge borrowing for Albemarle last year, so their number's gonna come up. Um, James City is actually looking at some, 
some debt this year, so that one's going to come up. So they're all are, are ever changing, um, and so um, it, we're going to be toward the bottom until we actually issue that debt. That uh, assuming you guys move forward with projects. When we look at existing debt service, so this is what is your debt service as percentage of, of your budget? How much of our annual debt service um, is a percentage of the budget? And so our policy is 10%. You can see we're just a shade over four, so we've got some room there. But this is one that traditionally most folks around the state um, constrain them more than anything. When you look at that debt service to expenditures, again, you can see we're basically at the bottom of the whole group. Um, Arlington is the only other one that's right near us. Ten-year payout ratio. Um, we don't have a. Um, this isn't a, a, a policy that uh, that a lot of folks have. We put this in several years ago. We wanted to make sure that we weren't um, borrowing money and um, still having a project that basically is completed, and we're still paying debt service on it, and now we're actually renovating it. In other words, um, traditionally, after 20 years, you know, you a school that we just built, we're now starting to put roofs back on it, we're, we're doing the HVAC, but if we borrowed over 30 years, we'd still be paying debt service on the original um, project. And so um, your payout ratio is really good right now because again, we haven't issued debt in several years. Um, we may, this is one of those policies that we may actually violate very temporarily because we haven't issued debt in a long time and we're assuming that you move forward with some or all of these projects we're gonna talk about in a moment. That is going to skew this number, but I'll tell you that that is not something we're going to be overly concerned about because we know it'll come back down over time, and so that's something that we'll just have to work through as we get into uh, the capital planning. So as John mentioned, what we were asked to look at was three projects, and we're going to do three different scenarios. Um, so first is a middle school project. Uh, the number that we were using is $68 million. Um, then we have an elementary school in FY26, and that number we're using is 38 million, using the same figure for a, a potential elementary school in 2027 as well. So the scenarios that we ran were basically uh, the middle school only, and that's scenario one. Two is gonna be the middle school and the first elementary, and then three would be all three projects. Um, we did wanted to show you the differences between a 20 year or 25 and a 30, just in case you were wondering. Um, again, our recommendation would be to move forward with a 20 year, which is traditionally what we've done on all our projects, but it is a big bump in the price tag um, in terms of debt service. So we just wanted to at least give you that. The next page is a table which has a lot of numbers in it. I'm gonna quickly go through it, explain it, and then I wanna walk through one of the scenarios, and if you want, we can come back to that slide. Um, and talk further about it if there are questions. Because um, this kind of has the meat of basically the, the rest of the presentation here. So scenario one, the middle school, if we do a 20 year amortization, it's about 4.6 million additional revenues that are gonna be needed. Remember, we already have $8 million in the budget. For this year, it goes down a little bit into next year. This is additional dollars on top of that that we're gonna need to actually take on just the middle school. If we do the middle school and in 26 do the elementary school, then we're gonna need 7.5 million of additional dollars in order to take care of both those projects. In order to do all three projects, we're gonna need $10 million more than what you already have in your budget. Not all at once, but basically over a couple years, we're gonna need that in order to take care of the additional debt service for these three projects. And I'll show you how we get there. The 25 year and 30 year assumes that you do all of those projects either at 25 or at 30 years. Obviously, we could run lots of different scenarios with different pro th with one project at 20 and one at 25 and things like that. But this just gives you an idea that, let's just, for example, the middle school only. By going 25 years, we save roughly $600,000 a year of debt service. Um, if we go out 30 years, we're gonna save roughly a million dollars of additional. I say save. You're still paying for it. You're going to pay for it for an extra 10 years, that million dollars um, extra. But, uh, but it does cost you in order to do that in terms of interest. Down at the bottom of the payout ratios, as I mentioned, we're going to probably fall below our policy, but we're not that far below it. With just the middle school, we've, we're at 59%. Our policy was trying to stay above 60. Um, and then you'll see if we take on all three, if you think about it, we're talking about 
68 plus 38 plus 38, we're gonna more than double our debt. And so what happens just mathematically, um, the payout ratio is gonna be a little bit lower for a little while until we, until we actually start paying some of that back. Because what we're, that measure is basically saying how much debt are you paying off in the next 10 years? Um, what the agencies don't wanna see is you, th you're pushing that off and kicking the can down the road. They wanna see you making some, some headway and we'll be able to show them that um, and they'll understand because of the nature of, of taking on so much more debt on top of what you already have. So let me walk through uh, the middle school project. <clears throat> we assumed that we were gonna issue it roughly a year from now, April of 25. Um, the market right now, interest rates are actually not bad. Um, we put a 50 basis point cushion in there for planning purposes. <coughs> we ran it at a 413. If we went to the market today, we're gonna be just a shade above 360, uh, probably, 3.6%. 3 so we're still under 4%, um, not bad for, not like we were a few years ago at 2%, but but still uh, pretty good interest rates over time. When we add that to our existing debt service, you know, like I said, we're, we're, we're just a shade above uh, eight million, we're right at eight million now. Next year for 25, it gets to be 7.4 million. That would be in your budget for coming up. Um, so in the additional dollars needed is roughly $5 million a year for this school. Um, that'll jump debt service up to about 12 million. So when you take the difference between that and the 7.4, that's the additional dollars that I mentioned earlier. When you look at it graphically, you can see how it layers on top. Um, we don't, again, have a big drop off until 2034. And this is that calculation of the additional dollars at roughly four and a half million. Essentially, it's the difference between that 12 million and the, uh, the, the 7.4 that we have now. The, uh, the policies, again, they look very well. You add the middle school on top of the existing debt. You can see we don't even get to one and a half percent, well above the, well below the three and a half. The post debt service expenditures were just at six percent. Still got plenty of room to get up to that ten, so we're in great shape there. Um, again, as, as I said, the payout ratio is a little bit uh, lower, but uh, we're, we're we're okay there. If you want to look at the uh, the other two, uh, I picked up one typo, and I went back through this. Um, the interest rates on the, um, when we add 100 basis points, it's gonna be closer to 5%, 486. It's a 433, it's just a typo there. So still in decent shape, but we're assuming, we're not, we don't know that rates are gonna go up um, in 2026, but we're just being conservative with our interest rates there, um, being that it's gonna be basically two years out. And so again, adding the debt service in, um, the debt service goes up from about 12 million up to about 14 and a half, 15 million. There's your impact on the debt profile. Again, it'd be about seven and a half million over two years, 4.6 in the first year, and about three million in the second year. Still in good shape on debt to assessed value. Debt service expenditures, still in good shape. You might remember some of those uh, other AAAs are, are up there in that eight, nine percent, so we're still in, that, in a good range there. And then payout ratio, again, is gonna come down a little bit more because we've now added even more debt uh, on top of our existing. And then finally, um, again, the third middle school debt service is gonna look like that. And essentially we'll need in the third year another roughly $3 million to take care of that. That's how we get to that $10 million number on that um, summary slide. Again, debt service to, uh, to assess, uh, debt to assessed value is in great shape, just below 2%, still gonna be in good shape versus the others. And then here we're just a shade above 8%, still uh, good from a planning standpoint. Again, um, we're gonna be still in that AAA range, not, not, a, not a concern. Um, I mentioned quickly about interest rates. Um, the the, this is US Treasuries, as a lot of you know, in January of 22, interest rates started rising. Um, they've been fairly trading in a, a, I'll call it a narrow range uh, for most of 2023. Um, but from a tax exempt standpoint, which is what we'd be borrowing these, these bonds on, interest rates have been coming down most of my career until now we hit that bottom in, in, in 2021. Rates have been coming back up. Similar to the treasuries, they've been trading in a fairly um, uh, range of about three to 4% there, uh, just a shade above four or a little bit. And you can see that they've actually come back down since November, we've actually seen a uh, pretty substantial drop in interest rates. They did go back up uh, last couple of days um, 
after uh, the unemployment last week. But um, I think once the Fed starts making their moves on the, lo on the short end of the yield curve, we, we expect the, uh, those rates to come down and, um, and longer term rates should moderate a little bit. So we'll, we'll see. Uh, we're also in a presidential election year, of course, and tr traditionally we've seen interest rates um, at least pretty stable. So we'll, we'll see as we go along. Lastly, uh, we do have an unusual yield curve. That green line, you can see uh, short-term rates are actually higher in the first several years than they are in years five, six, seven, all the way out to year 12. Um, but it's pretty flat after that, which is how we get that uh, nice three and a half to 3.6 percent interest rates right now in terms of 20-year debt. So not a, not a bad time to be out there. Um, I mentioned the Fed. Um, this is their, uh, the graph going back to 2015 of when they've been increasing in lowered rates. Um, the market is anticipating roughly uh, May, June is kind of what they're anticipating at this point. Um, a, lot of, a lot of folks thought was, were hoping or thinking maybe in March, but it uh, looks like that might be off the table at this point. So probably see some short-term rates starting to drop maybe this summer. So Mr. Chairman, with that, happy to answer some questions. Thank you, sir. <coughs> um, any questions? Well, uh, just looking at the scenarios, I'm a little confused as to why we were considering the third one looking at two elementary schools. When I do the math, it appears to me if you assume 1.5% population growth, elementary school capacity would need to increase by 57 students a year based on our target growth. So with that, one school would provide for more than 10 years worth of growth. So why would we do one right after the other? The intent, Mr. Underwood, wasn't to say we were going to do that. It was just to paint the worst case scenario and show okay. you that even w under that scenario, we're in pretty good shape as I see it. So, Yes. And then question two, is, is anyone doing 15 year debt or is it all 20, 25 and 30? For, for projects that have roofs, you know, construction, that type of buildings, usually we're doing 20 years. That's kind of the average life, spreading it out over the average life. Um, not to say we couldn't. Um, if we're doing fire trucks and ambulances, things like that, we're usually shorter lives, like 15 years, something like that. But I'm just the buildings, I haven't seen anybody. Not that we can't. There's no reason we couldn't. It's, I was wondering, like, if Goochland or some of the more aggressive ones have looked at it yet. But no, no. everybody's still 20? Yes, sir. Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions, comments? I agree, Dex. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Moving on to <clears throat> item 4.0, old business. There is none. New business. The board will discuss and consider authorization of a public hearing regarding the potential grant of an electric utility easement over county-owned property. And with this, I'll turn it over to um, John Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see Paul stepping forward. He, he may have details if there are questions, but. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, there's a, a subdivision we've approved up on Chestnut Fork Road uh, near Catalpa that's adjacent to 40 acres owned by the county. Uh, that subdivision property is actually split between Dominion Service Area and Rappahannock Electric Service Area. Uh, for Dominion to serve the portion that's theirs, they, they would like to have a 15-foot easement across the county owned property uh, for a line that as I understand it would be underground. Um, the board would need to authorize a public hearing to grant such an easement. Um, I guess the only thing I'd also throw out there is in the event the board doesn't want to grant it and decided to deny the easement, uh, as I understand it from the developer, then REC would serve the whole thing. So I'm not sure it matters what action we ultimately take, but Mm -hmm. I think we need to have the public hearing to make a determination. Is that right, Paul? Or if you don't want to move forward with it, I guess you can make a decision today if you want to deny it, not have the public hearing. But if you want to grant the easement, you would have to have a public hearing. Question? No question other than what's the will of the board. Well, my question would be, where does the easement go? Does it go right across the middle of the property or does it go down the property line? I mean, uh, it follows a northern property line of our parcel. Let me see, bring up uh, the first attachment, Kim. 
Okay. It's uh, right along the northern mm -hmm. property line. Shown there in red. That's it, but there's no questions or comments. What's the will? I don't want to get in between electric companies, so I suggest we authorize the public hearing. I'll make the motion that we authorize the public hearing. Can we get a second? Or I have no strong opinion. If anyone has one, please phrase it. I'm happy to be swayed however anyone would like. So if this easement is not granted, there would be just one power company supplying that subdivision? Is that my understanding? That is how That's I understand correct. it, yes, sir. Can you pull up the second attachment, please? The second attachment here shows the territory for Dominion and White and Rappahannock Electric and Green. So the area that's spread under the word Dominion is part of Northridge that would be served by REC if you do not grant the easement. If you do grant the easement, that portion would be served by Dominion as well as that portion of the county parcel and then the balance would be served by Rappahannock Electric. So, <clears throat> so the positive aspect of this then would be competition that may benefit the constituents? I think no? they're, what, if they're in the territory, they're, they are, that provider is who their provider is. I don't know if Dominion is cheaper or REC is cheaper, but if you're in that territory, you don't get to choose which okay. power company you use. And Paul, you wouldn't see any negative impact of running up the north side of the property line because generally there's a setback for any development that goes on that, so that wouldn't hinder it would not could. affect our use of the property. Um, our northern part of our property is in Dominion. If we put a facility out there, um, Dominion couldn't serve it. They would have to come from REC because they do not have any three-phase power up there. The lower portion of our property would be served by REC. So, and that, the more likely all of our property would eventually be served by REC because we would need three-phase and Dominion can't provide it up there. Are there any other examples of either one losing or gaining ground based on this type of scenario in our county or um, we've had areas? we've had a split parcel I mean the sports complex is one where depending on where the actual uh, meter base goes depends on which entity would serve it so it kind of depends on how you develop a property who your prop who your service would be and that's would be the same case for us um, I'm not aware of us denying any easements that I'm aware of under this scenario I don't see a problem taking it to public hearing. I really don't we'll vote on it tonight, whether you want it or not. So can we get a, is there a second on the motion or? Second, okay, so we have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Mr. Chairman, just to clarify, that public hearing would occur next month. Next That's month, I'm sorry. Time. Okay. Moving on to our committee reports. <clears throat> First up is public works. We did not meet, sir. Next, building and grounds. Supervisor, that would be you, that would be Dave, for building and grounds. Building and grounds did not meet. And <laughs> rules committee. Rules committee did not meet. Personnel committee. Uh, we did meet. The committee brings forward a motion that the board adopt uh, proposed updates to the county personnel management plan. I'll second that. Motion and a second. Uh, discussion? We, we, all in favor of moving the motion forward? Or, John, you want to elaborate on that? I did, just, if the board would like, we can uh, briefly summarize the changes, or uh, I think the personnel committee found them fairly straightforward, made a couple changes at the committee level, and it's really up to the board. That said, without clamoring, let's go ahead and call 
All in, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to public safety. Mr. Chairman, the committee brings forward a motion that the Board of Supervisors approve the addition of VHF, UHF antennas on the tower located at the dispatch center. The equipment will cost $6,400 and will serve the Culpeper Amateur Radio Association. Second. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Mr. Chairman, the committee brings forward a motion that the Board of Supervisors approve a proposed change to the charter of the Rappahannock Regional Criminal Justice Training Academy. Second, then I'd love to know the change. We have a motion and a second. John, if you would uh, read the board on that. Um, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Underwood, the, the, uh, the Rappahannock Regional Criminal Justice Training Academy is, a, is an academy. It was formed by several counties, not including Culpeper, but Culpeper has since uh, joined that, that group and, and we received training for both our uh, law enforcement officers and for the uh, 911 dispatchers. Uh, I think William's been asked to join their board and, and they've requested that we approve a charter change that I think they've undertaken recently and William, I hope you can elaborate. <laughs> yeah, some of the biggest changes um, were to give um, uh, communications directors a, a seat on the board to help with training for communications officers. Um, and they just revamped the, uh, the bylaws and um, added additional people to the board. Thank you, William. Any other questions for William? No. Thank you. Motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Moving on to item C. Uh, the committee discussed implementation of an ordinance to address regulations and penalties regarding repetitive false alarm calls. No action is requested, but staff is looking into some options that could be referred to the, directly to the board in the future. And there's a couple of uh, attachments here from other counties. So we've actually, the ordinances, the way I understand it, are being drafted now with uh, some different options. Correct. Okay. Any questions or comments regarding those ordinances? All right. <clears throat> Moving on to the E911 Board of Directors. And I believe that's um, Supervisor Lee. Looks like no, no action. No action. No yep. action on yep. it. Sorry. Item 7.0 is our Economic Development Director's Report. And that, with that, we'll turn it over to Mr. Rothnell. And he'll give us an update on their economic status. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. <laughs> Uh, just a few quick things to go over. Today, uh, items that we'll talk about are to our strategic plan, goal 1.1, retain and foster expansion of our current major employers and uh, specifically maintaining a positive business climate. Uh, goal 2.2, develop a robust business assistance program um, with advanced business particip uh, participation with area resources. We're bringing back the C3 Culpeper County Conference and also adding uh, a new event to the day on May 13th, we'll be back at Germana Community College in the Daniel Technology Center. Uh, we will, a little format change, we'll have two 90-minute sessions with three classes that you can choose from. Uh, we're still finalizing the schedule, but the items that we're looking at bringing are attracting and retaining talent, sources of capital, identifying the right customer, prioritizing your time and outsourcing, uh, action steps of successful selling and sales, and then finding your selling superpower. Um, we are doing this with partnership with the SBDC. SBDC will, uh, they arrange for the instructors and the courses. Uh, again, light, lunch, light breakfast and a lunch will be provided and then we'll have a panel during uh, lunch of Culpeper County businesses. Um, we'll be working with CDAC on Friday to discuss possibilities for that panel. 
Uh, new this year, though, we want to make this kind of a Culpeper business day. And in the afternoon and evening, we um, will have a Culpeper business appreciation. Uh, this is a reception to thank business owners purely for being in Culpeper County, just a nice networking time. Um, staff will be sending March at, through May meeting with business owners in preparation for the day. So kind of a, an advance check in with as many businesses as we can over those two and a half months um, to make sure they're aware of the day and then also to get feedback and information um, as they're seeing on the ground as business owners here in the county. Uh, this will be a free event. Uh, food will be provided, snacks and appetizers. Um, and this will be May 13th, same day uh, in the afternoon. We're looking at four to six. We are finalizing the location now, but I wanted to get that out um, so people can get that on their calendars for that er late afternoon, early evening. We are in the process of developing a new website uh, that should be launched this month. The issue with our current website is it was built for exactly as we wanted to present things at the time that we built the website, which was great for at the time we built the website. Um, things have since changed in the department. Um, so for example, trying to add uh, you know, the things that we now do, including uh, be a Culpeper local as we've integrated that in better into our office, adding the work in Culpeper.com, choose Culpeper Farms, which is our new initiative, and then also the farm tour. Those all were very difficult to promote on our current website. Um, they will be added to our new website along with some other features. Um, so we're looking forward to the website rolling out. With the new website also brings a new logo and new color scheme. Um, this will be the last month that we get to see the brown. Uh, the brown was very difficult to work into any of our marketing um, that I was working with. So this is our current logo that we've been utilizing since 2017. And then this is the updated one that we will be rolling out. The color schemes are pretty similar. Um, the green and the light blue, they've kind of lightened the tone a little bit, um, as well as swapping out the brown for a salmon color. And that's all I have. Looks good. Thank you, Brian. Is that, um, real quick, is that website that you're developing, is that connected to the county's website? Where you There'll be a cross -link? They'll link, yeah, they'll link back and forth as they currently do. Questions or comments for Brian? Thank you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Next up, we have our administrator's report, and it'll uh, turn that over to John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the board, very brief this morning. Just a reminder that uh, following our closed session today, we'll have a work session on the budget um, during which uh, Ms. Lamb will go over some revenue projections, and I'll, I'll paint a very broad picture of what we're working on, but we're still very early. So it should be a short work session. And then we have another one scheduled for February 15th. That's a Thursday morning at 9 o'clock. Um, and we'll have some of the bigger budget uh, departmental requests uh, on that agenda for presentation and, and some more update and discussion at that time. And then uh, again at the regular March meeting, things should maybe start to take shape a little bit more. So stay tuned. Uh, and under uh, my second item on administrator's report is just I provided on board docs the uh, American Rescue Plan Act funding summary. I hadn't given that to uh, the board in a while and uh, just took some time to update that, make sure it was clear um, as to where monies have been spent to this point and what monies are encumbered for other projects. Um, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions on those, but that's... Uh, just uh, to, to keep you informed. Uh, and that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, John. Any questions or comments for John? <clears throat> Thank you, John. Again, um, with that, I'll entertain a motion to move into closed session. Mr. Chairman, I move that we enter into closed meeting as permitted under Virginia Code Annotated Section 2.2-3711 a one three four six eight and twenty nine to one discuss and consider citizens appointments to the airport advisory committee and to receive legal advice 
regarding the potential options, limitations, and liability considerations as to the legal structuring of a jail facility as detailed in the Code of Virginia, the Virginia Administrative Code, and under other applicable law, and to discuss the consider, discuss and consider the acquisition of real property, a jail facility, the award of a public contract, and the investment of public funds therein, where a discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the financial interest, bargaining position, and or negotiating strategy of the board if made public initially. Motion and a second. All in favor, signify saying aye. 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 We're in closed session. Thank you all for coming. <clears throat>